very much um, for this <coughs> opportunity to maybe uh, express some of our problems in public to the people who can maybe do something about it, i.e. yourselves, the authors. Um, the subject of today's talk is plagiarism. And plagiarism is, for us, a growing problem. I've worked in publishing for 25 years, and I would say over the last 12 months, I've constantly had a, an ethics issue, and most often those ethics issues are plagiarism sitting on my desk. Five years ago, I would go for an entire year without any of these issues sitting on my desk. So something has changed, and I, I don't really think that plagiarism or ethics issues are becoming more uh, frequently uh, carried out. One of the change is that they're being more frequently detected. Plagiarism is something that should be taken very seriously because it can have catastrophic implications. So it's well worth investing some time in studying to, to understand exactly what is plagiarism. And I think there are a lot of people who don't really understand plagiarism very well. And then let's face it, the basic concept of plagiarism is extremely fundamental. I think all of us in our earliest childhood have either um, copied or been tempted to copy our neighbor in a primary school class on the Friday test. <laughs> And we've all very quickly understood that copying of your neighbor on the Friday afternoon test uh, can get you in trouble and maybe you get away with it, but you're taking a risk. And so the basic fundamental of plagiarism is, is really inside all of us from whatever background, and I think we all know in the bottom of our hearts that it's ethically wrong. So what is plagiarism? The definition of plagiarism given by the Collins English Dictionary is to appropriate ideas, passages, etc. from another work or author. Now, I think a lot of people think of plagiarism as, 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 as only text, passages, paragraphs, but effectively, within the definition of plagiarism, there is also the concept of ideas. It's quite clear that plagiarism has become much easier to do thanks to modern internet tools such as cut and paste. It, there is nothing simpler now than cutting and pasting a, a, a large block of text and putting it in, into your own work. It's becoming incredibly simple to do. You don't have to rekey it. You don't have to rewrite it. You can just cut and paste it. So the temptation to, to plagiarize is much greater than in the past. But the problem is that plagiarism has become much easier to detect. Anybody doing a Google search can, can, can quite often detect plagiarism. Teachers at school detect plagiarism in their students' essays. There are very sophisticated tools being developed on the internet now to detect plagiarism. So effectively, the opportunity for plagiarism is increasing, but the uh, facility with which detection can be carried out is much greater. Now, I really move into the fundamental part of what I'm going to talk about today, and that is, what are the types of plagiarism? And I think everybody thinks that plagiarism is, is a very simple concept, but the American Medical Association defined four types of plagiarism. The medical, medical, American Medical Association Manual of Style Guide for Authors and Editors, ninth edition, uh, defines four distinct types of plagiarism and I'd like to run through all these because I think some of you are probably very familiar with certain of these types but not all of them. Now to, to illustrate the subtleties of the four types of plagiarism I'm going to use one of my fa favorite quotations of all time uh, which is a quotation from William Blake The Marriage of Heaven and Hell and the quotation is The Tigers of Wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. So this will be the, the uh, little phrase that I'll use to, to try to illustrate the different types of plagiarism. So type one is insufficient acknowledgement, and the definition of insufficient acknowledgement by the AMA is <coughs> noting the original source of only part of what is borrowed or failing to cite the source material in such a way as the reader will know what, it's or, what is original and what is borrowed. So if I take my phrase from before, 
I could turn that around to say, in my opinion, tigers are cleverer than horses. In a medical context, this would relate to presenting an old technique as a new one, maybe by mistake, as a result of poor literature research. So effectively, insufficient acknowledgement can be a deliberate plagiarism, but it can also be accidental. Type 2 plagiarism is defined as paraphrase, and this is restating a phrase or a passage providing the same meaning but in a different form without, without attribution to the original author. And so, my, taking my, uh, my quote from William Blake earlier, if I re, re, re turned this around and said, angry large felines are smarter than educated equines, and put that under my name, then this would be a good example of paraphrase plagiarism. I've changed all the wording, but basically the meaning remains the same. In the medical context, Disguising an old technique to make it look like a new one would be a good example of paraphrase. So, you see, in this example, we are well, well away from any copying of text. Here, we're really taking the concept and rejigging the concept to make it look like your own. So, this is also considered to be a sort of plagiarism. Type 3 plagiarism is defined as mosaic, and this is defined as borrowing the ideas and opinions from an original source and a few verbatim words and phrases without crediting the original author. And I take my, uh, my original William Blake again, and I could turn that around to say, our research, very verbose, our research has shown that Tigers of Wrath are significantly wiser than horses having undergone an extensive educational training program. So you've extracted little bits of what was there before, you've added a little bit of uh, flowery language to it, and you claim it as your own. Mosaic, in the medical context, you could say that copying parts of an original paper unsighted this is often done by people with limited language skills and, uh, you know, who are struggling with English. They'll take a, a few paragraphs, from, particularly from a methodology, and uh, they will reproduce it as their own. Now, sometimes when a methodology is, you're just following a method, method like, methodology like you would be following a cooking recipe, it's quite okay to copy somebody's mythology. But if you do copy somebody's mythology, then you need to use quotation marks and you need to make sure that it's appropriately cited. And so long as you do that, there isn't a problem. But if you don't do that, then this is considered as mosaic-style plagiarism. So type 4 plagiarism, I think, is the type of plagiarism that we're all familiar with. And this is verbatim lifting of passages without enclosing the borrowed material in quotation marks and crediting the original author. So in this case, I just reproduce exactly the quotation from William Blake, the Tigers of Wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction, and I put my name to it and claim it as my own. In the medical context, copying verbatim a previous paper, but under a completely new author without citation. Now, you would be amazed that we have had abstracts submitted to our congresses, we have had papers submitted to the Multimedia Manual of Cardiothoracic Surgery, where the entire article or the entire abstract has been cut and paste. The only change has been the author's name and the author's affiliation, and people submit that material to us. We've had, and we've had numerous examples of where this has happened. Of course, the correct at attribution to my phrase is the William Blake. William Blake, quotation in quotation marks with the full literature citation below. 
So let's move on to think about the sanctions for plagiarism and what can happen. Effectively, types 1 and types 2 of plagiarism, i.e. insufficient acknowledgement or paraphrase, are extremely difficult to prove. It's extremely difficult to prove that if you rejig somebody's wording completely and don't use the same language and you disguise the way you've taken their ideas, it's incredibly difficult for anybody to actually prove that you've done wrong. But there's always going to be a, a nasty smell associated with types 1 and types 2 plagiarism. But effectively, in reality, it's difficult to prove that you've committed a fault, but it's going to leave a nasty taste in the editor's, uh, in the editor's mouth. Type 3 plagiarism, mosaic plagiarism, is still very risky, but, but also difficult to prove. If people have just plagiarized little bits and pieces of text here and there, and strung them together in a different way, you recognize certain bits of it, but again, it becomes very difficult to prove and actually quite difficult to detect because plagiarism software will not, will not pick it up. However, again, it is very risky because the software is getting better and effectively, uh, again, editors will very quickly realize that if uh, just a few paragraphs have been taken from somewhere else, it's going to be detected. They might not be able to do anything about it or feel able to do anything about it, but certainly they will remember it. Type 4 plagiarism, direct plagiarism, is very easy to prove and it's very easy to sanction. So what are the consequences of plagiarism? College endum. In, you know, if you, if you publish a, plagiar, a plagiarism, the, 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 probably the lightest consequence of that is that there's going to be a published corrigendum, which is going to point out that this, uh, this work duplicates uh, or play, has plagiarized text that has been published in the past. And that is in the really less serious cases. That would probably only be a solution to mosaic plagiarism. Often these authors will be banned from submission to the journal for, for, for either a lifetime or a period of one, two, three years, depending on, on the severity of the plagiarism. In serious cases, work can be retracted and, uh, and effectively the current method of retracting a paper is extremely embarrassing because the paper there will be in an issue of the journal uh, uh, an, an, a notice pointing out that the retraction has taken place but now with the online journals the archival article is now published in PDF format with a big retraction notice written across it so it's very very obvious obviously people can't go back into the print issues in the library and, uh, and, and change them but now with the online environment uh, plagiarized work from the past that is plagiarizing work from the past will, will receive a, a big red retraction watermark across it so it's going to be blatantly obvious for all time what has happened. Very often if you, uh, in the instance of a, a serious plagiarism being detected it is standard practice to inform the plagiarizer's institution and very often this results in dismissal. Now we've all heard cases where plagiarism has happened in major institutions and big names in science who have plagiarized have been dismissed outright from their jobs. Institutions don't like this because it completely undermines the scientific credibility of those institutions and institution heads tend to take this very seriously. If you want to look online, there is very clear guidelines about plagiarism and how it's dealt with. If you look at www.publicationethics.org, there are a whole series of flow diagrams that uh, indicate exactly how plagiarism is and should be dealt with. It's like a guideline for, for dealing with plagiarism cases. The final consequence of, of extreme plagiarism is that you could be actually sued. Uh, now, this doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. Okay, detection. Software is now available for manuscript processing systems which detects plagiarism. EACTS are investigating impl implementation of the cross-check and authenticate software for all of their journals. This is software which will be implemented 
in the, in the manuscript processing systems, which will compare submitted manuscripts against the entire medical database which is held in Crossref, which is like the clearinghouse for all scientific articles. And if plagiarism is detected, it gets flagged, and we can do something about it. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that plagiarism is extremely lazy, it's cheap, and it's extremely risky. Its detection is now much easier and is on the increase. So I would thoroughly recommend that you just don't do it. If you want more information about plagiarism, the, sci uh, the Scientific Style and Format Manual of the Council of, Scientif uh, Council of Science Edit Editors gives an excellent uh, resume of uh, the all ethics issues and plagiarism in particular. And again, I would recommend the COPE guidelines, www.publicationethics.org. Thank you very much. I'm glad that Ian Beecroft didn't start uh, giving you some examples. They are regretfully numerous. I can give you a, just a piece of advice. There is a cheap poor man's method of detecting plagiarism. Take a complex sentence out of the results or discussion segment. One really complex sentence. Paste it to the Google or Google Science in brackets. If it was ever published in the same form, it will immediately come up with the name of the author who plagiarized that.